Hello, I'm Lee Teschler, Executive Editor of Design World Magazine, and today we're going to tear down Google Glass, a type of wearable technology that includes an optical head-mounted display. Google Glass displays information in a smartphone-like hands-free format and lets its wearers communicate with it using voice commands. It's also got a touchpad, so users can make swipes and taps on the pad to enter commands. A built-in camera records video and images. Finally, a liquid crystal on silicon display generates images that users see by means of beam splitters and reflecting mirrors. So now we're going to tear into this thing and take a closer look at its technology. Now Google Glass is relatively easy to get apart, at least compared to other consumer products we've seen that also aren't designed to be disassembled. A single Torx screw attaches the pod to the glass's titanium frame. Um, once you get past that, you get into a lot of prying off of plastic casings, first around the prism that pivots. Um, some dental tools kind of come in handy uh, when you're doing that. But it might be easiest to understand Google Glass by starting with the simplest component, the behind-the-ear module. That's where the battery sits. It's actually a 3.7 volt single cell lithium polymer battery with a capacity of 570 milliamp hours. Um, if this thing wears out, you're out of luck. There's no way you can replace it without cutting into the plastic case it sits in. And what you can see here is that the battery connects to the rest of the circuitry through a little flexible circuit that's visible here. But behind the circuit and the battery is this device here, which is actually a bone conduction speaker, which also seems to work as a push-button switch. Now I'll pry the, uh, pry the cap off here so you can get a little bit better look at this. And there you see the cap. Yeah. On this side of the main board, you can see the power on off button here. The object next to it is the connector port right here for the recharging cable. The main component of note on this side of the board is the Wi-Fi transceiver made by Universal Scientific Industrial Corporation in Taiwan. It's basically a Wi-Fi Bluetooth transceiver on a chip. It's also based on a Broadcom 4329 chipset. That's here. The next item of interest is an audio codec, this one from Texas Instruments. That's here. An audio codec basically converts analog audio signals into digital signals for transmission. This one also decodes digital signals back to audio. It has five audio input channels and also of interest for Google Glass. It has drivers for running piezo coils or speakers as are used for the bone conduction speaker we showed a bit ago. Finally, there's a MEMS digital microphone. That's here. But it doesn't appear to be the main microphone because there's another mic up near the prism and camera assembly. Actually, it's tough to tell this is a microphone at all because the microphone port is on the underside of the device, so it just looks like a metal can. I've seen some speculation uh, that the mic on the main board is just used for noise canceling, but it's hard to see how in that the circuit boards are fully enclosed in the plastic case, and of course, so is the microphone. The only noise this mic would be able to pick up really well would be the noise your finger makes tapping or swiping the capacitive touchpad. So perhaps it's there to cancel out a finger noise, but of course I'm just guessing. This would be a great opportunity for someone out there who actually knows about this to use the comments section below this video and chime in on this. Now we'll flip the board and examine some of the major components on the other side. Once again, here is the connector port for the recharging cable. Next to it is a GPS receiver there. 
made by Cambridge Silicon Radio. It's based on an ARM7 processor, as are a lot of smartphone-style products. It also uses a sensor, which doesn't reside on this board. The sensor actually sits on another flex circuit, which we'll get to in a bit. One other component we noticed on the main board was a 435 series surface mount thin film fuse. This one's from Little Fuse. There's a marking code on its top surface that seems to indicate this one is ready to handle two amps at 35 volts in normal operation. Now these fuses are obviously tiny, which is why they're often found in applications such as handheld portable electronic devices. They're designed to open in less than five seconds when they see 200% overload. 200% uh, overload for this device would be something like four amps. And if you look at the time to open curve on its data sheet, you see that on average, it'll open up in a few tenths of a second at that level. Of course, you hope that never happens. If this fuse opens, it stays open. In that case, the Google Glass will no longer work. We can't discern from the circuit board what the fuse is protecting, though it sits near the USB charging port, so it may be protecting against a short during battery charging. The big chip here is a 16 gigabit NAND flash memory chip from Toshiba. This chip also incorporates a controller that basically acts as a memory manager, doing things like error correction, managing bad blocks, garbage collection, and translating logical addresses into physical addresses. Again, this is a flash memory chip, so it's non-volatile. And because it is a NAND memory, it can be written and read in blocks or pages. Next to the flash memory chip is a synchronous DDR2 DRAM memory chip holding 512 megabits. And as a quick review, DDR stands for double data rate, which comes from the fact that the chip transferred data on the rising and falling edges of the bus clock signal. This chip is what's called the mobile version, meaning it consumes less power than conventional DDR2 chips. Uh, one reason is that it works from a 1.8 volt supply rather than a 2.5 volt supply. Also, it refreshes less frequently than an ordinary DDR2 under a couple of scenarios while sitting in a chip package that's smaller. The synchronous DRAM is apparently integrated with the main processor in Google Glass, which is an OMAP 4430 from Texas Instruments. Uh, this is a dual core processor that uses the ARM Cortex A9 architecture. Among the features that are, are of particular interest for the Google Glass application are a built-in multimedia processor that comes in handy for handling video, and an image signal processor for handling screen graphics. Now the small chip here is an FPGA. This one is from Lattice Semiconductor. It's a one kilobit mobile device and, as it turns out, it's also used in the Samsung Galaxy 4S smartphone. Next we come to the power management IC for the OMAP processor. This is another Texas Instruments device, and there's quite a bit going on in this thing. It's specifically designed for applications powered by a rechargeable battery. It's got seven step-down converters that provide up to two amps for memory, the processor core, I.O., and so forth. It includes a real-time clock that can provide second, minute, hour, day, month, and year information, and an alarm wake-up. This is also the device that handles battery charging by virtue of a built-in switch mode charger. Before we move to the touchpad, we'll note another mechanical switch here. I'm not sure which, what this one does. I haven't seen it mentioned in any of the tutorials, so perhaps a viewer who knows can chime in. Now we'll move to the touchpad. The main component here is the capacitive touchpad controller. And that's here. It's from the Synaptics. A capacitive touchpad includes electrode layers that are basically traces of conductive material. And atop that conductive uh, material is an insulator layer, which is usually called lens material in the parlance of capacitive touchpads. Each conductive trace has a baseline capacitance. So when a finger touches the insulator layer, it changes the capacitance 
of the conductive traces in its vicinity. The synaptics chip measures the change in capacitance to notice the uh, position of the finger and determine whether you're tapping, swiping, or whatever. So the touchpad surface itself is on this part of the case. And uh, now we'll take the uh, touchpad circuit board out and see if we can get a closer look at the uh, flex circuit. And as you can see here, visible are the uh, conductive traces on the the action portion of the uh, touchpad. A complicated flex circuit connects the main logic board to an assembly mounted on the other side of the pivot hinge that lets the user move the display into a position that's comfortable. Uh, the assembly on the other side of the hinge contains the display and prism, a camera, a microphone, an ambient light, and an ambient light sensor. Uh, the microphone is a, another MEMS digital device and the digital nature of it comes into play because it incorporates an analog to digital converter so the output of the microphone is a serial digital bit stream, not an analog audio signal. Again, it's kind of hard to tell if this is a microphone just looking at the package. We'll take a closer look and that is actually the microphone. Now, looking at it, you can't see the microphone port, so it's a little bit hard to tell. It just looks like a metal can. Also on the flex circuit is a 9-axis InvenSense inertial sensor, and that is actually there. The inertial sensor is a combo 3-axis gyroscope, 3-axis accelerometer, 3-axis digital compass and it includes an onboard digital motion processor. Now the flex circuit wraps around and through the frame to make a connection with a combination prism, display chip, and camera. Uh, you'll see a number of other components on the flex circuit and uh, those are super high density connectors. That's what those are. As well as an ambient light sensor here. And that brings us to the uh, glass display, the prism, and the camera, which hinges from the frame here. The display chip is very small. This is actually the back side of the display chip, uh, backing up to the prism. Uh, the display chip is glued to the prism, so now we're going to remove the glue carefully to reveal the display. And here is the display. Google says it has a native resolution of 640 by 360 pixels, and the pixels are roughly an eighth the physical width of those on the iPhone 5 Retina display. Uh, the glass camera, which you can see here, seems to be the kind you'd find in a typical smartphone. The final point to note is that the camera and display are on separate connectors, so they appear to talk to the main circuit board independently with no direct connection between them. So there you have Google Glass in a nutshell. As in any teardown, we've made some educated guesses about the functions of some of the components and about the rationale behind some of the design decisions. If you think we've messed up the analysis, we invite you to speak up in the comments section below.